welcome you to uh, AAS very first virtual event, uh, assessing the financial uh, support for businesses during the pandemic. Uh, our goal is uh, to assess the state of play in three areas. One, uh, loan support to uh, businesses, particularly uh, federal lending programs. Two, uh, financial risks that uh, come in the form of either exposure to lawsuits uh, from uh, coronavirus litigation or from uh, courts imposing uh, business interruption insurance on, on those who had properly excluded virus-related events in their contracts. Um, I want to thank everyone in advance for joining us. Um, I'm, I want to also thank the AAF staff for the effort they put into this, in particular Natalie Winkleman, uh, the Director of Events at AAF, uh, and, and Thomas Wade, who is going to be our host for the event. And I want to thank our, our panelists as well um, for bringing us their expertise. And uh, at this moment, I'd like to turn it over to Thomas to run the event. Thank you, Doug. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and I'd also like to reiterate my thanks to, uh, to Doug, our speakers, and the audience also for being here. As Doug mentioned, I am Thomas Wade, Director of Financial Services Policy at the American Action Forum, and I will be acting as your moderator and host for the afternoon. Uh, so just to let you know how the event is going to run, uh, the intention was to be slightly different from a normal panel event where we might all talk at the same time and I'm not all that good with Zoom yet still. Uh, so instead, we're thinking more in the line of quick fire fireside chats with three experts on topics relating to the financial challenges businesses are going through during this terrible pandemic. So the three topics will be uh, the status of uh, financial relief as provided or not uh, by the Federal Reserve's emergency lending uh, facilities, and that will be led by Professor Hal Scott of uh, the Harvard Law School. Our second topic will be business interruption insurance uh, as it relates or not <laughs> to the pandemic and recent calls for some sort of federally backed pandemic program. Uh, and with that, we have uh, for that we have Sean Kevlin of the III. Uh, and finally, we will discuss the growing concern as to the exposure of businesses to the potential wave of coronavirus-related litigation, uh, or not. That one that one didn't really work. And for that, we have Joel Griffith of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, so as far as the format is concerned, I will invite each speaker to take a couple of minutes just to lay out their intellectual stall, just as if they were providing congressional testimony. Uh, I will then be asking each expert questions from myself and also questions from you, the audience. Uh, so do send those in before moving on to the next topic and speaker. Uh, lastly, and finally, some quick housekeeping. As mentioned, uh, we will be taking audience questions. So please either use the comment function on whatever streaming service you're using for this, or just email us at uh, contact at the American, sorry, contact at AmericanActionForum.org. Questions will be anonymized, and apologies if we don't get to all of them. After the event, a recording will be made available on the event's webpage, along with other materials, including an AAF overview primer on the status of business relief. So that being the case, that's enough uh, dancing around. Let's get started. Our first topic this afternoon, as I discussed, will be the status of the Federal Reserve's emergency lending facilities. And to lead this discussion, I'd like to invite Hal Scott, Emeritus Professor at the Harvard Law School and President of the Committee on Capital Markets Regulation. Hal, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Doug and team, including Thomas, for inviting me to participate in this important event. My focus, as Thomas uh, already stated, is on the Treasury Fed Main Street Lending Program authorized by the CARES Act last March a major part of which was designed to help small and medium-sized businesses, SMEs for short. Much of what I will say is based on the September 3rd statement of the Committee on Capital Markets Regulation concerning Main Street, which is available on a website. Uh, CCMR believes that small and medium enterprises will need financial support for several years to recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. While our economy is improving, given the depths to which it fell, there is still a very long way to go. Small business revenues continue to be well below pre-pandemic levels. A key part of this financial support should come from the Main Street program authorized by the CARES Act. So far, the three for-profit business fit facilities of the Main Street program, which have been operating for over two months, have fallen far short of their desired results. 
Secretary Mnuchin has estimated that between 25 and $50 billion in loans will ultimately be issued through Main Street, significantly below its existing lending capacity of 600 billion and below what is definitely needed for economic recovery. The latest Fed figures released last Thursday show as of now, only 1.9 billion of actual loans have been made. In order to get the needed support for small and medium enterprises, uh, CCMR, the Committee on Capital Markets Regulation has recommended that Main Street be significantly restructured to take on more credit risk by providing that the Federal Reserve's facilities purchase 100% of all loans, not the 95% as presently provided, leaving banks and other eligible financial institutions as just processors. If banks take on any loans, they will apply normal credit standards that many needed businesses cannot meet. Secondly, these loans should be below market rates, lower interest rates, 1% versus 3% provided now, and longer maturities up to 10 years, coming close to equity without actually doing equity because equity would require extensive capital restructuring of small and medium enterprises, which is not practical. Congress has already appropriated 404, excuse me, $454 billion in the CARES Act to back Fed lending facilities, $351 billion of which remains unused and could be used to provide additional treasury uh, support for a more risky Main Street. Currently, the treasury is only providing $75 billion of support for the $600 billion facility. The Main Street loan should be made on a first come, first serve basis based on available data and objective criteria to ensure that the government is not picking winners and losers, that is the Fed, and that the prospective borrowers have a reasonable chance to survive. Data of this kind is available from Dun & Bradstreet, and loans should not be available to businesses that can get market rate funding from their own banks. The Fed must also reach out to the hardest hit and un, uh, underserved communities so that they can take advantage of this program. It is indisputable that SMEs, the backbone of our economy, have been very hard hit by the pandemic and need support to recover. A V-shaped recovery, meaning that the economy will, win the next, will within the next year bounce back to pre-COVID level is highly unlikely. According to the latest economic projections from Fed officials, the economy will likely contract between 3% and 4% this year. Most officials do not expect the economy to completely recover until 2022. While the latest unemployment figures have improved, the level is still very high at 8.4%. Secretary Mnuchin and Chairman Powell testified before Congress last week to the effect that the Main Street program perhaps should be replaced by direct spending, such as an expanded paycheck protection program. In my view, the Congress has already provided $454 billion in appropriations to back lending. It might not be direct spending, but it is spending, it definitely is a fiscal response. Also, the ability to have a new fiscal approach of this kind is far from certain given partisan differences as to how this should be accomplished. The Mnuchin Pelosi ongoing negotiations underscore this. Finally, a lending program, even with significant losses, would be much less expensive than expanded PPP, which is a forgiveness program. There is no guarantee that these recommendations will succeed in saving American small and medium-sized businesses, but the current approach has been tried and found wanting. These recommendations would give many small and medium-sized businesses in America a fighting chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hal. Let's get straight into it. What do you see as being the key obstacle preventing the Fed from dispersing the funds that we know it has available to the businesses that need it the most. You mentioned term sheets. 
Do you believe that's the biggest problem? Uh, well, it's, there's something behind the term sheet. So I, I think the biggest problem from the beginning has been the refusal of Secretary Mnuchin to take credit risk. He's repeatedly said that he doesn't want to do that. Okay. Um, and um, unless you take credit risk here, you're not going to serve these businesses. So I would say a large part of the problem from the outset has been, what is the attitude towards credit risk? I think the Congress said, here's $454 billion, take some risk. I think that that's interesting. And the fact that you mention uh, Mnuchin does bring me to another point uh, or, or related point, which is the, the better or more polite way of saying this would be, what do you see the ultimate goal of the money that Congress appropriated for Fed being? The less polite way of saying this would be that industry rumor is that one of the uh, reasons why the Fed has been somewhat slower to get off the ground here was due to a difference in opinion between the Fed and Treasury as to the degree to which the loans should break even. Do, do you believe that's a valid, sorry, let me rephrase that. Do you believe that the intent of these loans should be to break even? Should be what, Tom? To break even. Um, to break even on the $454 billion? The I, I think the Fed should not lose any money. So the question is, how much risk should the Fed take? Now, Congress has said, take up to $454 billion worth, okay? So that's my break-even measure, okay? In other words, I don't think the Fed should lose any money. They can lose it, they can print it, but for reputational purposes, and in terms of what the Fed should be as lender of last resort, not a fiscal authority, I don't think they should be taking this risk. But I think there's plenty of money there uh, that Congress appropriated to allow the Fed to take a large amount of risk. And, Interesting. and be protected against any losses. No, absolutely. Do you, if, if that is the case, then what do you think about the general lack of demand for, or the reported lack of demand for Main Street services? Well, I don't think there's, uh, you know, if you uh, tell me that um, uh, I've got to be a high credit worthy borrower, um, that I've been, I have to borrow at a 3% rate payback in five years. And I've got to go through all sorts of documentation. I mean, the documentation around this program is incredible. If you say all that, I'm going to say uh, I'm not interested. If I'm a business, a normal business that needs credit, I'm not going to Main Street. I'm going to my bank and get credit. So I think the lack of demand is two parts. One is the terms are not good enough for the people who need it. Okay. And secondly, the banks have to take 5% of each loan, meaning they will apply their normal credit standards, which means they will not lend to the neediest borrowers. Should they? Yes, that's the $454 billion. There. That's the risk. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. To, to what extent do you believe that, or rather, um, House Financial Services Chairwoman Maxine Waters last week had uh, some strong words at Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Uh, and one of the interesting points on which their argument turned was the ability of a Fed uh, emergency lending program or any of the ones currently designed to make loans to the smallest borrowers. Do you believe that is something the Fed can do? Do you think it's something the Fed should do? Or do you believe that power is more appropriately with the PPP and the SBA? Well, under my proposal, that's what they would do because, and, and, you know, under the existing program, the banks are making the loans, the feds are buying 95%. So lending decisions be made by the bank. So your, your question is really important. If the fed makes 100%, they're making the loan, okay? Even than just buying it, they're making it. And do they have the capacity to do that? Um, you know, I think there are metrics out there, okay? You know, we have the whole non-bank lending fintech world out there. And metrics exist to judge credit, okay, in that world because, of, you know, like you can't go to China. They can't get these normal credit things that banks do, churning out reports, going to the borrowers, and so forth. So metrics have been developed. And those metrics are used by non-bank lenders every day. 
So those are available to be used. And secondly, data on who can really benefit by these loans is available, as I said, from down in Bradstreet. So let me give you an example. Suppose there's a business that before COVID had 50 employees, and now they have two. You're not recovering, okay? Lending to you is just a waste of money, okay? But let's say you have 25 employees and you're functioning, okay? We can, we know that, we can know that, okay? So it's not gonna be perfect, but we can, I think, distinguish between the hopeless cases and the people that can benefit by the loans. Is that the job or the role of credit rating agencies? Well, we can't get the credit rating agencies in here because you're dealing, you know, a credit rating agency is going to go down to, you know, Mike's Pizza Place. Um, you know, that, that's just not going to happen. And who's going to pay for that? Uh, so there's not a role here for the credit rating. You, you have to look at, you know, what's their payment history? Have they honored their payments? How many employees do they have? What's their revenue and so forth? It can't be a credit rating thing. If not credit rating agency, then that sounds like an enormous amount of investigative work for the Fed. Yeah. Luckily, they have so much time. Yeah, well, I don't think credit ratings is a solution to this problem. It's very yeah. important. It was very important, however, in the uh, capital markets programs of the Fed. What bonds are they going to buy? What ETFs are they going to buy? And so forth. But lending to small and medium enterprises is, doesn't work. Staying on uh, credit risk for a moment, can we talk about the role of the banks in the Main Street Lending Program? Uh, what is the right role for the banks? How should they qualify? Who should qualify? And uh, how should they be incentivized? Well, as I've said, I would not have the banks making any credit decisions. I'd have the Fed do that, okay? As long as the banks are making credit decisions, the, the, they're going to insist on high credit standards. They don't want to lose money, all right? So the role of the banks are processors, as was the role of the banks in the Paycheck Protection Program, okay? So they would process documents, applications, and so forth for the Fed. And by the way, it need not just be banks. It could be other providers of financial services. So um, that's the role I see for them. They got to be compensated for that, okay? And so they should be paid fees, processing fees, as by the way, they were in the Paycheck Protection Program. And I know you're gonna talk about liability later in this program, and they should be protected against any like liability for misprocessing, okay? It's, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, they can go out and do whatever they want, but unless it's an egregious, horrible mistake, they should not be held liable. Uh, if they are, they're gonna not do it. So. Uh, that's the role of the banks, processor. I, I am mildly concerned, given more recent news, that uh, not a single bank has received any forgiveness from the SBA yet. So okay. I do wonder about their continued willingness to play their part in a system that so desperately demands their role as processors. Excellent point. I mean, you know, this Paycheck pr pr Protection Program, uh, you know, has gone through so many uh, unpredictable stages um, and this is the latest one, uh, you know, which really goes to the credibility of the entire program because the government can't get, you know, the guy, what's going on here, Thomas? The government's worried. They were worried before who they gave the money to, okay? You know, to Donald Trump's kid's school. Oh, that would be terrible and so forth. So now they're worried about who gets forgiven. You know, are we going to forgive a loan to a company that really doesn't need forgiveness? And if we do... We're going to be criticized. So I think what's going on is the political concern surrounding forgiveness and that if they start forgiving people, then they're going to be attacked for forgiving people they shouldn't forgive. Okay, thank you. I think one last question from me. Uh, this is somewhat hypocritical of me because I very much see a continued role for the, the Fed in the provision of emergency relief, and not least for the amount that's still locked behind CARES that's, that remains uncommitted. But at the same time, given that the Fed's balance sheet is you know, now at $7 trillion up from four at the start of the year, what fears do you have about the role to which the Fed is propping up the economy or scope creep at the Fed? This is a critical question, okay? Unfortunately, we don't have time to solve it right now. That in a more perfect world, I believe that all of this support should have come from the Treasury. 
the fiscal authorities, not from the Fed. Okay, so this would have no impact on the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. So if Congress appropriated money to the Treasury, okay, spend this money. Now they could establish the program and have the Fed as their prospector, right? Have not have anything on their balance sheet. I think as we go forward with lessons learned from COVID, we have to re-examine, and by the way, I wrote an article some time ago with Doug on this. We have to um, re-examine the appropriate role of the Fed and fiscal authorities and where that line should be drawn. And I think what COVID is teaching us is that a lot of these Main Street facilities if you know, would have been better as pure treasury facilities not Fed facilities, because that avoids the balance sheet effect and also, importantly, avoids blaming the Fed for the Treasury's failures, because the Treasury controls these programs under the Dodd-Frank Law 13.3. They have to approve them. They have to approve the design. Now, these Main Street facilities are the product of Treasury decisions, but the Fed is out there looking like they're responsible for it. And I don't think that's a, a good way to uh, run the railroad. I think there are only so many things the Fed can continue to juggle in any event anyway. Thank you very much, Howard. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I think I left you with a bunch of stuff already. <laughs> okay. In which case, thank you very much, Hal. Thank you for taking the time. You're welcome. Thanks, Tom. With that, we'll move on to our second uh, conversation for today, which as a reminder is about uh, business interruption insurance and the degree to which it relates to the ongoing pandemic. And for that, I would like to welcome uh, Sean Kevlin, President and CEO of the Insurance Information Institute. Sean, thank you very much for being here. Hey, thank you very much, Thomas. Good to be here. Uh, good to see you again. Um, just for some context, the Insurance Information Institute is a 60-year-old nonprofit organization. Um, our mission is to be a trusted source of uh, data-driven insights on insurance to inform and empower consumers. So we, um, as an organization, we don't directly lobby, nor do we sell insurance to the AAA. Um, one way to, I think, an important start of this discussion is the fundamental understanding for why global pandemics are largely uninsurable. Compared to other catastrophes, hurricanes, wildfire, vandalism from civil unrest, a pandemic is not limited to time or geography. What we're seeing right now with COVID-19 is it impacting every community, every economy, and all at the same time. And with this, it, it, from an industry that relies on the lar law of large numbers, you simply can't pool risk in a way that, that, that would be efficient. Um, beyond the enormity of the catastrophe um, of a pandemic, a virus does not cause direct physical damage, which is nearly always needed to trigger property insurance policies, particularly for business insurance and business interruption insurance policies. The federal government is really the only entity that has the capacity to provide financial relief that businesses need to sustain themselves. And unfortunately, because we don't have a federal system in place that we can turn to for making relief widely accessible, fast and efficient, um, if there's no system, we're gonna start seeing two unfortunate consequences that are happening today. First, politics and day-to-day -day gridlock have taken over the relief discussions. We've got delays and business owners as a result are becoming more fearful uh, and desperate for help. And secondly, as, as you know, sensing this desperation Trial attorneys have unfortunately dusted off their playbooks and seized on the opportunity. Uh, they're selling a, a, a false sense of hope to consumers. They're filling courthouses with litigation that is attempting to retroactively fit contracts by manipulation of language and interpretations. Uh, more elements that we're seeing of these, uh, this trial attorney playbook that plays out all too often in our society and causes what we call social inflation. Um, you know, they're pulling in celebrities and big brands, big PR stunts, fueling the airwaves and enormous amounts of advertising. And then they're also just attempting to further their settlement strategy through legislation and regulation. The insurance industry is concerned about these, these misguided and costly attempts, mainly by trial attorneys to take capital away that we've set aside for claims which are actively being paid right now as we're in the midst of extreme seasons of hurricanes and wildfires. Uh, we've also seen incidents of, of rioting and civil unrest. 
Uh, to be clear, our own economic analysis at IIII shows that any attempt to retroactively pay business interruption claims would put systemic strain on the insurance industry. Uh, notably, this, this industry was uh, one of the financial services industries that weathered our, our previous recession well because of how safely we, we look at our capital. But in this case, it would only take a matter of months to bankrupt the industry. I should note that uh, insurance is often the highest contributor to economic growth uh, among financial services. And during these COVID-19 months, uh, the industry is not just keeping its nearly 2 million people employed, it's, it's actually hiring in all areas of the industry, property casualty, life, health, agents and brokers. So Thomas, we applaud you and, and AAF for bringing the attention to, these, uh, to this discussion. We hope that further discussions and actions will occur in federal legislation to put in place a relief system that is, again, widely accessible, fast, efficient, and most of all, not jeopardize the strength and stability of any one industry. Thank you, Sean. That was an excellent overview, and you touched on a lot of the questions I want to ask you. So let's start maybe with this idea of physical damage. One thing I find really fascinating about this question is that although the uh, coronavirus pandemic feels de novo where we've never dealt with anything even remotely like it, what I find really interesting from a pandemic insurance perspective is that the insurance industry did in fact deal with this in the, after the outbreak of the SARS epidemic, although thankfully there was far less in the way of loss of life, at least in this country. And it was in many ways the lessons learned from the SARS epidemic that led to a lot of insurers writing in viral exclusion clauses into their contracts. So I think the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the legal case really rests on these two pillars, the lack of uh, direct physical damage and in many cases a specific viral exclusion clause. Both of those seem relatively strong, legally speaking, I'm a lawyer, not in this country. That being the case, why is this even in the courts at all? Well, you know, again, I think this is a reflection in, in that where we've seen these types of things play out in other ways, where we've got a community and, and, and an industry that's built upon litigation and settlement. And and so, again, you're put, you're, it's almost like they, there's a playbook here. I mean, whether it's the opioids issue and now they're seeing it in business interruption. You're absolutely right. Um, first and foremost, direct physical damage. You know, if you think about it, um, the, you know, a virus you can, you can take away just through extensive cleaning. It is not the same as if you're a restaurant and your kitchen catches on fire and burns down. Um, and, and so there's the, the difference between the two. We actually have seen several uh, suits uh, filed and dismissed. Um, but again, it, it, part of this is, is it only takes one or two jurisdictions to be favorable, which and that the trial attorneys will lean on. Um, in terms of the, the language that you mentioned as well with SARS, um, we look at that more as even just a clarification on the direct physical damage. Um, but it is quite clear um, there is a standard policy uh, process that the industry uses. Not all contracts use the standard policy, but those that do will have this exclusion of, of viruses in it. Um, it's right, very clear on what we call the declarations page that, that you see first and foremost. The, the type font is even regulated. So, so things are very, I mean, the, the insurance industry is arguably one of the, the heaviest, the highly, most highly regulated industries in the world in the United States. So um, all of this has been worked out hand in hand with regulators. And, and we are also pleased that the regulatory community has, has come to our side on this and, and noted what we're trying to make clear as well. Before we go into any conversation as to a form of pandemic, uh, a federally backed pandemic program, are you seeing general support from lawmakers at either a state level or a federal level specifically on the court cases insurers may or may not be going under at the moment? We are. I think in the beginning there there was an acceptance of, again, the, the, the trial attorney community seemed to jump right in um, and, and try to, to inform or misinform, I should say, uh, legislators and regulators, and some uh, were hearing it. Uh, and, and as a result, they took some immediate action, uh, almost what you would call knee-jerk reactions. Most of those, the, any legislative attempts uh, have not gone anywhere. Um, and then we are pleased to be, we personally testified in, in a virtual con congressional forum. And, and I think everybody understands the value of insurance. Everybody seems to understand that if we never underwrote this in the first place, what we would essentially be doing if we paid the contracts is taking claim dollars away from Americans who have paid them for other things. 
uh, whether it's an auto insurance policy or whether it's, it's a, a business insur insurance policy, you're taking claims away and then you're causing potentially systemic strain. So that, that has seemed to resonate. We are pleased with it. We've seen some of the legislators understand after we've informed their discussion or informed them of, of the facts of this, we've seen them pull back on the legislation as well. But you know, we're, we still see legislation that looks entirely like a, a litigation settlement strategy as well. Thankfully, it, it hasn't gotten much traction. How are insurers currently impacted by this? It, it feels to me like it's almost binary. It hinges on whether the courts go one direction or the other, or is it far more piecemeal than that? Are, are some insurers paying out claims that you're aware of, or is there just the enormous risk that all of them may have to? It's, it, we're truly looking at an issue that, that's fundamental to insurance and, and fundamental to business insurance. It's, you, know, you think about it, it's property. You need to have damage to a property. And if you don't have that damage, you simply can't have a policy be triggered. And, and so this is, this is something that we're seeing our, our you know, insurance members uh, who support the IIII even you know, need, to, need to, to maintain this because it is a fundamental. Um, there are though policies that that have language in them that that you know, and, and that would cover a, a virus. It would be very costly, um, and when that happens, we are seeing our members paying out claims. Uh, so, so the, some are happening, but it's it's not a widely used type of policy, and therefore the industry is intent on making sure. And, and again, this is this is something actually insurance has to go through a lot because um, they, because we keep a lot of capital on hand. Uh, so in case things happen all at the same time for in terms of covered catastrophes, and, and honestly, what we're even seeing this year, very active hurricanes, very active wildfires, other issues uh, happening with civil unrest, you know, those things can be very costly. We've paid, you know, tr tr over a trillion dollars in claims in the last few years. And so, but but those, those attorneys see that we have a surplus of around $800 billion to pay claims and they believe that they can go and use that for, for their own purposes. And so uh, we do need to hold our ground and we, need, we do need to make customers understand that we're here ready and paying covered claims. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, and please don't uh, believe that that false sense uh, of hope that, that trial attorneys are trying to sell. And I think it's, it's worth bearing in mind, of course, the fact that this is uh, an enormous issue for insurers, but everyone as a result of the potentially systemic nature of uh, payouts that insurers may potentially have to pay. But going all the way back to the start, another way of looking at this issue is that it is, in many cases, small businesses or medium-sized businesses who are looking for support that they are not currently getting from the government, desperate for financial re relief from somewhere. So that sort of tees off the last part of this question, which is, what more do you see the federal government as needing to do? And in particular, funny you mention hurricanes and floods because the obvious uh, comparisons to a flood insurance program or even a terrorist risk insurance program, do you think that that is a necessity for the U.S. and do you see us going in that direction? Well, I think you know, what we say first and foremost when you're looking at a solution is recognizing that this is completely different. You know, a pandemic is completely different than even an act of terrorism. I mean, when we look at 9 11, you know, you primarily had two economies, uh, city economies, really, urban economies that were impacted Washington, D.C., and New York City. Um, as I've mentioned before, what we're seeing right now is something that's happening everywhere all at the same time. And, and so any policy solution needs to recognize that. But we believe uh, as well, uh, we need to, to have some certain principles in place. And, and as I mentioned, the federal government being the, the only entity that has the capacity, the federal government should also be the primary provider of relief. Um, and, and that's important. So we believe that the federal government should be that primary agent uh, in terms of the relief and the relief funding. And I mentioned before about a system. I mean, what we're seeing politics take over is because there's no system in place. So what's the system for main, making widely accessible relief, you know, keeping people, keeping businesses open, keeping people in their jobs and doing it very fast and efficiently. Um, and, and as such, we, you know, since we don't even know how long this will run out, we're, we are a little concerned that we haven't been having discussions about these solutions and, and what could happen. Um, the other part of it is while we're protecting people from businesses, from losses, and trying to incentivize them to, to keep employees, we just want to make sure that from an insurance perspective, we're not trying to jeopardize our other commitments. And so I've mentioned that about retroactive payments being paid. 
there's also some concerns that, that we might try and create uh, or, or extend presumptions around workers' compensation that some states are considering. And, and again, those are those are just uh, you making rising costs happen, potentially putting strain on the industry. We're we're extremely active right now as an industry, given all of the extremities that are out in this world. And, and so we want to make sure that we're there for the customers and, and not being burdened by trying to provide as much relief uh, to, to an issue that's that's simply uninsurable. That makes sense. Thank you. And this is going to potentially borrow uh, a little from our final session from today, but would you like to see some form of federal liability shield against claims for business interruption? Certainly, uh, you know, businesses having liability shields will, will be important. Um, what, what's interesting is, is, is it's, it's a bit of a, uh, I don't want to say contradiction, but you're hearing uh, that businesses rightfully want their liability covered so that they can reopen and not be liable. Uh, most, of, most of the time, that liability, if it is an issue, comes back to the insurer. Um, so, so yes, we absolutely want to make sure that that liability is covered. Um, and, and while we can also uh, work to get these businesses back open through federal financial relief. Great. Thank you, Sean. A anything you'd like to leave us with? You know, if, if your audience is more interested in this issue, particularly we've, we've set up a microsite. Uh, it's www.fairinsure.org. Great information there. Great comparisons of, of policy solutions that have been presented. Uh, principles that we talked about here today, or you can even see others, uh, regulators, legislators who are talking about the issue. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sean. And thank you again for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will turn on to the third and final uh, question and answer session for the day. Uh, we are now going to be discussing that issue we touched on just at the very end there, uh, protecting businesses from the costs of a growing wave of coronavirus-based litigation. And for that, I'd like to thank and welcome Joel Griffith, a research fellow in financial regulations at the, at the Institute of e Economic Freedom and Opportunity at the Heritage Foundation. Joel, thank you very much for being here. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And it's been a fascinating discussion so far and an area, sadly, that does need a quite a bit of focus. Uh, so over the last uh, several months, uh, we have seen a wave of lawsuits uh, crashing in the courts uh, against uh, companies uh, for unreasonable anti-pandemic measures. Um, so people that have caught COVID, whether they actually caught COVID at the place of business or whether they did not, uh, they are suing uh, these uh, companies. We've seen lawsuits against cruise lines, Carnival Cruise Lines, uh, restaurants, retailers, and a Walmart's been subject to some of these suits. And the suits are coming from both employees and also from patrons. Uh, and really when uh, companies are a face of this type of litigation, especially when it's a smaller business that is not able to disperse uh, those uh, costs throughout their company, uh, it does give businesses a pause for concern before reopening. Uh, because even if those companies are following local guidelines or federal CDC guidelines, following those guidelines in and of itself in the current state uh, legal environment uh, might not be sufficient to protect those companies against those lawsuit um, costs, whether they, and those costs can be either from losing the lawsuit or from just being tied up in court and, and running up those legal fees. That can uh, uh, eat away at a small business's uh, profit, um, even with just 20 hours of, of those legal fees uh, sometimes to these smaller uh, companies. So we do believe that there uh, can be a role uh, for uh, Congress uh, that would allow these claims, many of these claims to, that are alleging negligent implementation of pandemic mitigation, that would allow these claims to be dismissed in many instances. And uh, there are two pieces of prior federal legislation that this can actually be modeled on. Um, if you look back to following 9-11, there was a lot of concern uh, and lingering concern as well, but concern over uh, what the next terrorist attack might look like. Uh, uh, whether uh, we would end up with a uh, spate of um, some of the suicide bombings that we've seen across uh, the world. So Congress passed in 2002 the Support Anti-Terrorism by Fostering Effective Technology Act. It's a mouthful. Uh, we can just call it, in short, uh, the Safety Act. But basically that act offered uh, liability protections uh, to companies that were using new tools and programs and, ser and services um, that could um, protect themselves against uh, these, these attacks. 
Um, and basically, uh, what that did was that so long as the government gave the green light to these types of tools and safety mechanisms, uh, that if a, a company were using those, that they weren't going to be held liable for using uh, that that tool set. Now, of course, that act only applies to acts of terrorism. It does not apply to pandemics. But we could model legislation on that that would say, look, if if you are using, um, if you're abiding by guidelines, for instance, state guidelines that uh, that have capacity limitations or that have sanitation requirements, so long as you are abiding by those local guidelines, then you are not going to be subject to a lawsuit. Uh, from somebody that um, actually did or just claims to have contracted COVID from your establishment. Uh, so that's one piece uh, of, of model legislation to look like that we that to look at that we can adapt here in 2020. The other was the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. That's the uh, the Prep Act, and that basically bars uh, lawsuits for use of drugs or, or or devices that are regulated by the FDA. So once again, that's not, uh, we, we can't use that in this instance. That doesn't apply to uh, sanitation equipment or other types of devices that are being used by businesses now. But this is something that once again can be easily um, reworded to actually fit what we're facing now. And the bottom line should be uh, that, that businesses that are utilizing basic safety precautions that are recommended by their state or local government and that are abiding by the guidelines that are set forth so long as they're abiding by them, there really needs to be a safe harbor so they can have the peace of mind to to operate. Uh, and uh, once these the, once this legislation is in place, a business could actually gain that peace of mind by preemptively going to that state agency or going to the judge and actually proactively having their procedures certified. And that really, really uh, um, in, raises the bar for these lawsuits. Uh, look, I, I'm an attorney myself. Uh, there's a lot of good lawyers out there, but at the same time, there are a lot uh, of lawyers that are looking to capitalize um, on this uh, on this pandemic, and a lot of these lawsuits, uh, uh, sadly, are being launched uh, against companies um, that actually are in compliance with these uh, state and local guidelines. So and these these companies need to know that once they're once their mayor, once their governor gives the green light to reopen, that so long as they're abiding by those guidelines, they are not going to be subject uh, to uh, to these lawsuits. The the health of our business community depends on it, uh, and really the health of our communities uh, depend on this legislation uh, being enacted. Uh, we've seen a few states that have already moved forward with similar legislation on their own. Uh, uh, Kentucky, Missouri, Alaska have passed a um, a form of this. Uh, now is a time really for Congress to start uh, considering doing the same. Thank you, Joel. So one thing I'm still trying to get straight in my head is the difference between some sort of blanket exclusion from liability such that these cases don't even get to the courts versus some form of financial relief for businesses uh, undergoing court procedures. It sounds like your preference is very much for the former. Yes, uh, the former. Uh, the latter would be actually funding, uh, really funding some of the legal um, charges that these companies are incurring. Uh, that would not be uh, appropriate for the government to be involved with that. Uh, but but uh, what this has in mind is giving companies the peace of mind that if they're following, let's say, for instance, um, you know, we have Florida that has far different, uh, they have far different capacity limitations than than New York, for instance. Well, in the state of Florida, so long as you're a restaurant abiding by those restrictions, um, you, you can't have a lawsuit brought against you uh, for, uh, let, let's say the, the restaurant was at operating at 100% capacity, which they're now allowed to do in Florida. Um, with this type of legislation, you would not be able to bring a lawsuit against that restaurant saying, look, even though uh, the, the law permitted full capacity, this really was negligence on the, uh, uh, on the part of that restaurant. Um, this would preclude you from bringing such a lawsuit. 
Thank you. And it's interesting to me that you refer to the peace of mind of businesses to operate. I think you did mention this, but it's also important to us in the economy that we do have businesses operating at all. And if this wave of, uh, as you say, wave of cases could prevent businesses from opening or make it more difficult for businesses to open, then that presumably is something that the federal government should look at. Thank you for providing a couple of different models for legislation that might help address this issue. I'm surprised you didn't mention uh, Senator McConnell's uh, policy approach. Would you like to speak to that? Yes, yeah, so Senator um, McConnell has um, actually, uh, they do have legislation that mirrors uh, some of this uh, proposal and has gained quite a bit of traction with uh, Senate Republicans. Uh, but uh, we have not seen it gain similar traction in the House of Representatives. And I think it's important to keep in mind that there are some special interest groups at play, as there are in every piece of legislation. Um, and there are quite a few trial lawyers uh, that, are, that, that stand to benefit uh, from this wave of lawsuits. Um, and uh, that, that looks to be a major impediment to getting this type of policy passed. Maybe, Joel, you could talk a little bit further about, uh, again, as a lawyer, one of the things that I find fascinating about this issue is that take almost any form of employment-related uh, litigation and slap the word coronavirus on the front and you mm -hmm. have a new class. So, for instance, the McConnell legislation, while it has proved controversial, uh, one argument against it is that it is only even one very specific class of potential case, uh, that of exposure. So it's interesting to note that even the uh, Senate legislation that has the highest chance of success in and of itself only attack, attacks one form of coronavirus litigation. Yeah, you're right. It, it is a quite a bit narrower than what this uh, when, what our uh, suggestion would actually include. Ours would go uh, far beyond that. It would include uh, employers and uh, also retail establishments. Thank you. Uh, one question here uh, from the audience. Uh, under your proposal, isn't a fact-finding hearing needed to determine whether the business is complying with state guidelines? Uh, well, it, we we would envision being able to go uh, uh, basically di directly to uh, to to the the governing authorities, and if you wanted to have them come in and actually look to certify the business is operating course according to those procedures, um, you could have that done. Then the burden of proof would shift to the plaintiff. Uh, to actually prove that those guidelines were being uh, violated. Uh, I, I think what, what we really have in mind here are these instances where incontrovertibly that business is acting within the local law, um, but yet the lawsuit alleges that those actions are actually still negligent. So think about situations where, um, the, let's say the social distancing guidelines um, are, are loosened. Let's say that the capacity limitations are broadened. And somebody alleges that by the business um, operating underneath those new guidelines and having more people on those premises, that because of that, somebody contracted the virus. We want to be able to preemptively say uh, that so long as that business was operating according to the new guidelines issued by that uh, local government, that that lawsuit cannot be based just on the fact that they were operating with those with, with higher density or with less social distancing. I'm reminded of the uh, mesothelioma cases back in the day where courts were attempting to prove which one of five factories had contained the single strand of asbestos that caused the lung failure. And I think we're going to see similar difficulties in proving exactly who contracted what and where. Uh, one last question, I think, for you uh, would be, do you see there being a uh, important differentiating factor between whether or not these cases are brought by employees versus member of the public, or is it all the same? Uh, I think in some instances, uh, the lawsuits brought by employees, it might be um, modestly easier to prove that it was contracted uh, on, on site. Um, but I would say that in terms of which has more economic consequence, uh, this, new le this, this proposal legislation as it relates to retailers and the bar and restaurant industry, I think uh, likely shows a lot more importance. Uh, because as we know, a lot of uh, white collar workers are, are, are we're mostly able to work remotely. The sector right now that is being most impacted by the remaining shutdowns and most imp impacted by the loss of employment, that is that service sector, the bars and the restaurants. So I think that this legislation in relation to that sector is actually far more important uh, than in the way it might help uh, just, just uh, typical office um, locations. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. 
uh, acting somewhat as a devil's advocate here, uh, understanding that this is a uh, litigation prone country, uh, proponents of litigation will say that it is one of the most effective and efficient tools of employees and members of the public enforcing their rights on businesses who uh, have contravened those rights. So what would you say about uh, any criticisms that blanket exemptions from liability are reducing the rights of people who, who work and frequent these establishments? Well, I would agree that there'd be concern if this were a blanket prohibition uh, on that the, on those types of lawsuits. But think about the case of an employee. Let's say you uh, let's say the the local government has uh, suggested that there be half occupancy of your office building and that there be a temperature check taken upon entry if you're over a certain number of employees. And let's presume, for the sake of argument, that that establishment that that business is abiding by those terms. Similar to the retail side, so long as that company is abiding by those regulations, uh, by the suggested local regulations, then if somebody were to contract COVID, whether they actually did contract it on the job or contract it otherwise, it would preclude that type of lawsuit. Now, if that very same business had been disregarding those local requirements to do the temperature check or the other guidelines regarding capacity constraints, in that case, you would still have a cause for action. But do you think that the the person bringing this suit, putting aside the trial attorneys for a moment, should have a, a form of redress or somewhere they should be able to direct their complaint? Uh, well, they could certainly still uh, attempt to bring that lawsuit uh, in court. But with this legislation in place, all that business would have to do would be able to show that those uh, that those required procedures were in place at the time the person contracted the virus. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. What do you think would be the most uh, efficient or effective thing that Congress could do right now? Do you think there's any help at an agency level? And what do you think of the timelines involved with this? Uh, I think on a, on a congressional level, um, legislation that would embody what we discussed, where if, if a business is following the local regulations, not just the federal CDC guidelines or, or those guidelines, but the local regulations is very greatly state to state, um, that would be uh, quite helpful in, in giving businesses that, that peace of mind uh, to, to speed up the reopening process. And should that be something specific to the state rather than any sort of federal requirement? Oh, sorry, uh, let well, me phrase that better. Yeah. No, no, you understand, please. Yeah, well, well those guidelines will often be state specific, but the exactly. basic bar could be set by those federal CDC um, uh, requirements. Uh, but I would err on the side of caution with that. Uh, we've seen uh, the CDC offer an array uh, of suggestions that have varied uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think the, the, on, the, on the state level, we've seen um, a, a great amount of um, flexibility. We've seen some states that have been able to reopen more quickly, more safely. Um, and for those businesses in those states, I think it'd be, uh, we should be requiring um, any type of liability limitations, so long as they're meeting those lower state guidelines. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, just, just one related to this idea of federal pandemic risk insurance. We've seen some legislation proposed. I know um, Congresswoman uh, Carolyn Maloney has has a, has a proposal out there, uh, and, and this would would basically offer a, a, a private public partnership or to protect businesses in the event of another uh, pandemic for for their lost um, lost revenue. I think we need to be very cautious before getting the government involved with that type of an insurance uh, program. Uh, this would really uh, um, loosen, diminish the amount of accountability that state and local government officials have for the shutdowns they've imposed. Um, like we've seen, uh, some of the estimates are that half of the restaurants in New York City, for instance, might be going out of business. Uh, meanwhile, you have other cities that have allowed a far a more speedy reopening and their unemployment has plunged now below 5% uh, once again. So providing this federal type of a program will really alleviate a lot of the accountability that those local officials do have to their communities and their, biz and their, and their, and their, and their business community because they can impose draconian shutdown orders and now those businesses will receive money courtesy of the federal government subsidized and backstopped by the taxpayer. Uh, that would be an inappropriate use of uh, federal power and I think would have negative um, economic consequences going forward in future pandemics. That's really fascinating. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much, Joel, generally. Uh, thank you for being here and sharing your thoughts with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. So with that, uh, I would like to 
bring this event to a close. I'll give you all a couple of minutes to get onto your next meeting. Uh, thanks once again uh, to all of our speakers for making the time today and giving us their insight. Uh, thanks the American Action Forum team for putting together this event. And thank you, the audience, for watching and sending in your questions. If you did have any more, please do uh, continue to send those in and we'll see what we can do to help. After the event, a recording will be made available on this uh, event's webpage, along with other materials from the AAF relating to uh, business relief. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. Stay safe and have a good day.